Welcome. You are a privileged audience today. You are the audience for the first annual Intellectual Freedom Lecture given at the Iowa City Public Library. So I, I hope you realize your own importance. I'd like to thank the Iowa City Public Library Board of Trustees. I see a couple members in the audience for providing the funding for our Intellectual Freedom Festival. We have named the Intellectual Freedom Festival in honor of Carol Spaziani and many of the people in the audience and myself have just come from a, a nice brunch where we got to praise Carol for all of her fine works both in the community and related to the library in her long years in Iowa City. The name of Carol Spaziani and, and the concept of intellectual freedom have always run together for those of us at the library who've worked with her for many years. Her lifelong commitment to the freedom of ideas is something that has inspired all of us. I know certainly personally I have been inspired by Carol, challenged by her. Uh, Carol doesn't care what's practical, she cares what's right. And <laughs> she insists that you do it. And I think every manager needs someone like that on their staff. And I will miss Carol, but I understand she's busy as ever out there in the community. I'm going to introduce our lecturer today. Her name is Ann Levinson Penway. She is the Assistant Director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom at the American Library Association. She provides support and assistance to librarians combating censorship of library materials. A 1985 graduate of Northwestern University School of Law, and left private law practice to join ALA. By virtue of her position as Assistant Director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom, Anne also serves as the Deputy Executive Director of the Freedom to Read Foundation, a legal defense organization dedicated to upholding First Amendment rights in libraries. <coughs> Anne has appeared in the national media, including the National Public Radio's Talk of the Nation with Ray Suarez, and the New York Times as spokesperson for the freedom to read and is the author of several articles for the library press on intellectual freedom and fighting censorship. The title of her address today is Detour on the Road to Grandmas, Can Censorship Kill the Big Bad Wolf? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm flattered and delighted to be here as the first or inaugural speaker, I guess, for your Intellectual Freedom Festival. I can't think of a better way to honor um, a librarian who has provided such extraordinary service for this community for so many years. My all-time favorite book banning was the assault on Little Red Riding Hood from a few years ago, because Red was bringing a bottle of wine to Grandma. <laughs> What was worse, Grandma felt better after she had a few slugs. <laughs> but because of that, the book was pulled out of a few schools in Emporia, California, as if a child in California had never seen anybody drinking wine. Well, then there was the great Where's Waldo breast ban, to quote Anna Quindlen in a column she wrote about it. Someone on Long Island, apparently someone with a great deal of time on their hands, managed to find in one quadrant of one of the Where's Waldo books an illustration of that perennial prepubescent boy's fantasy, making the lady who is sunning herself at the beach with her bikini top undone, face down, sit up suddenly, exposing herself. And in this case, the weapon of choice was an ice cream cone applied to the small of the back. Suffice it to say, no one's looking for Waldo on that page anymore. <clears throat> Some of the challenges that we hear about are fraught with an irony apparently lost on the censors. Uh, one of my favorites was a challenge to a book called Myths and Their Meanings, because the complainant um, felt that these stories of ancient Greek mythology and Greek heroes threatened the foundations of Western civilization. <laughs> Or there was the discovery in a school in Irvine, California a few years ago that for years, uh, um, until somebody finally found it worth questioning, for years they had been using 
expurgated copies of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 in classes with all the naughty words carefully blacked out in, in magic marker. Of course, this is a science fiction novel about a scary, futuristic, book-burning society. <laughs> This year we had a challenge to an edition of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid in Bedford, Texas, because the illustrations which depicted bare-breasted mermaids were allegedly pornographic and satanic. Uh, my favorite Little Mermaid story happened in uh, Arizona, where a convenience store in Arizona was asked to remove um, the video, the Walt Disney video of The Little Mermaid, because somebody thought they saw a phallic symbol in the illustration on the cover. Well, the owner of the store felt that they would give the complainant the benefit of the doubt and they removed the, the video temporarily and looked at it and looked at it and ultimately they just couldn't see it and finally one of the, they replaced the video and one of the spokespeople for the stores in, in, a, in a newspaper interview said that he, he really couldn't understand the complainant's thinking and began to wonder what this particular person was <coughs> thinking when she was driving down a highway lined with telephone poles. <laughs> or, <laughs> wheeling her cart through the produce section, but anyway. <laughs> a book called The Wicked Stepdog was challenged in Billings, Montana because it uses words like boobs, ass, and smoldering kisses. Pickets appeared at a local library board meeting with those words emblazoned on their picket signs. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. Um, I was interviewed this week uh, on a radio program in West Palm Beach, Florida, and the very aggressive sort of Rush Limbaugh wannabe type host kept insisting, you know, well, well, surely you don't think that children should have access to, def we were talking about a banning of a dictionary, to definitions of words like, and then of course he gave all kinds of words that define various sexual practices. And I thought to myself, you know, this is a textbook illustration of the hypocrisy of some of these censors because if he really believed that these words were inappropriate for children, he would not be broadcasting them over the public airwaves at an hour when children might be listening. But that point was lost on him. Several art books were recently uh, ultimately retained, but only after parents uh, at a school in Tucson, Arizona, challenged them because they contained nudity. Among these allegedly pornographic, perverted, and morbid titles were the graphic work of M.C. Escher, Great Paintings of Children, El Greco, The Drawings of Renoir, Georgia O'Keeffe, and The World of Picasso. Well, unfortunately, only a minority of the censorship challenges that come to the attention of the Office for Intellectual Freedom are this silly. Most of them are quite disturbing, even if numbingly routine. Uh, there are still the challenges every year to what I've come to call the big three, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, the catcher in the rye of mice and men. And as I told my earlier audience, one of my favorite stories about the catcher in the rye is uh, a banning of that book um, from a school, a high school, in Boron, Boron with a B, California, uh, where the complainant who challenged the book because she objected to profanity was quoted on the front page of the New York Times as saying, I don't know where the hell they got that book. <laughs> Incidentally, I forgot to tell you earlier that the English teacher whose reading list was thus challenged replaced that assignment with Ray Bradbury's for Fahrenheit 451. <clears throat> Complaints about the classics often center around a, a single word or words used on one or two pages in the book. And I mean a single word, like one damn or one bastard or one sucks. Any of you with... Uh, Children, I'm sure, have learned at one time or another how many and various are the things in the universe that suck. <laughs> but the main reasons for challenges that we're hearing about continue to be generally offensive language, sex, especially homosexuality, witchcraft and Satanism, and violence bringing up the rear, sort of the four horsemen of censorship, if you will. Um, this year, however, I noticed another very small but disturbing, I don't know if I could even call it trend, but I noticed a few challenges that were of a different nature. Consider the following examples. A book called It's Only Love was expurgated apparently by a self-appointed censor at a library in Coquille, Oregon, uh, along with several other books, mostly mysteries and romances. Single words and sexually explicit passages were whited out by a vandal who left either dots or single lines where the words had been in the books. Annie on My Mind, an award-winning uh, young adult novel by Nancy Garden that deals with a teenager's realization of her lesbianism, was burned in Kansas City, Missouri, and is now the subject of a lawsuit there. 
The New Joy of Gay Sex was removed from the River Bluffs Regional Library in St. Joseph, Missouri by a patron who refused to return it, uh, delivering instead a petition with 700 signatures demanding its permanent removal from the collection. In Corvallis, Oregon, half a dozen sex education books were discovered ripped and unreadable. Multiple copies of nine titles totaling 19 volumes, including books on sex and women's history, had been targeted by someone who librarians there thought must have been thinking that they were practicing a sort of a grab and rip censorship. Uh, the librarians discovered uh, that it was rather systematic when five copies of the same title had the same pages ripped out. One such book, Talking With Your Child About Sex, was discovered with only its cover remaining. So it seems that vandals and vigilantes have invaded some of America's public and school libraries. And while I can't say it's a trend, uh, the fact that even this many such incidents have come to the attention of the Office for Intellectual Freedom is disturbing. Um, we know that overall, only about 20% of the censorship incidents that actually happen ever come to light or, or ever come to the attention of our office for one reason or another. So I'm sure that there is more of this happening out there than is getting reported to us. In these instances, the vandalized materials, if they're still in print, are ordinarily replaced and they remain available to library <coughs> users. But the fear of ideas is alive and well. I mean, look at these parents who challenged the books in Arizona, which included plates by Picasso, El Greco, Renoir, Georgia O'Keeffe, labeling them pornographic, morbid, perverted. These were texts, by the way, that were being used in an art class. It wasn't as though they were sort of lying randomly about, you know, festering, waiting to corrupt the minds of any child who should happen to come across them. But can you imagine the worldview that thinks that merely viewing or mere exposure to a work by Picasso, El Greco, or Renoir is in and of itself corrupting? We hear a lot about families these days. According to many conservative organizations, family values are under attack. But the single most disturbing thing that I hear in connection with censorship attempts is that there's only one kind of family that counts, and it trumps all others when it comes to library collections. And I'll give you an example. There was and continues to be a dispute in the Fairfax County, Virginia public library system over the availability of information on the subject of homosexuality. It started with a dispute over a magazine for the gay community called the Washington Blade, which is a freely distributed magazine available uh, in library lobbies there. In the midst of this controversy, the leader of the push for removal argued that her community's library is a family library and therefore shouldn't include such materials or any other materials deemed by this self-appointed representative of families to be inappropriate for children. Did I miss something here? Families with gay members aren't families. Childless people are excluded from this definition. You know, our family library should only have those materials which would be inoffensive to children. Don't unmarried or childless people have families, parents, brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, aunts, uncles, cousins? Did gay people sort of burst forth like pods from outer space with no families, no parents, no brothers and sisters? This woman seemed to proceed from the untroubled and sincerely held assumption that the only kind of family that counts when it comes to civil rights is a nuclear family unit headed by a married heterosexual couple with at least one heterosexual child and who agree with all other such right-thinking family people about everything. In her mind, such families trump any other kind of family when it comes to First Amendment rights. She basically seemed to believe that no one who lives in a family would be interested in gay issues or information about homosexuality. And I wondered to myself, would somebody who had really been using that so-called family library be so clueless? Well, the instigator of this controversy has now allegedly started an organization called Family Friendly Libraries. And let me just say that if some of the proposals that have come forth in Fairfax and Loudoun County, Virginia, are this person's idea of family friendly, we're all in trouble. One of these proposals at one time included creating an adults-only section, physically segregating books um, where you would have to show proof of age 18 to enter. You know, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. In this adults-only section would go all the books, not only about homosexuality, but all the books about abortion, witchcraft, mythology, and sex. The effect in this community, which happens to be surrounded by colleges and universities, where many of the students there are under 18, 
uh, would be that students who are under 18 would have to write home to mommy in Idaho or California to come with them to the public library. Um, if you don't trust your 17-year-old kid to go to the public library, how can you trust him to go away to college? I submit to you that libraries are the most family and community friendly places and institutions you can go and you can support because they respect the information needs of all of the people who use the library and they refuse to impose one view of what is appropriate on everyone. They also refuse to interpose themselves in the role of parent. Um, and some of the people who complain loudest about government interventions in families and issues of parenting in other contexts for some reason don't seem disturbed at the notion of forcing a library to act as a parent. What the proponents of these allegedly family-friendly libraries are really saying is that in the interest of preserving a sort of Norman Rockwell fantasy of the perfect family and for the convenience of parents who feel burdened by or ha having to make and enforce decisions with and on behalf of their own children about what their children shall read, all adults should be reduced to having unrestricted access to only those materials deemed appropriate for children. And those materials should be selected by the right kind of families for all those wrong kind of non-families out there whose rights don't count and who are obviously evil and misguided, especially if they let their kid use a library card. But I used an interesting phrase there. I said, if they let their kid. I have made the shocking presumption that there are parents out there who actually have some faith in their own ability to raise their kids, to set loving li limits and enforce them lovingly, and who, who have some faith that their kids actually absorb some of these rules and obey them or at least feel darn guilty when they don't. <laughs> but calls for censorship not only of libraries, but of television, video games, computer bulletin boards, etc., they all presume an abdication of parental authority. They all presume a loss of control. Proponents of censorship of these media often use language that presumes this absence of control. Television is said to invade the home you know, as if it could do it all by itself. I picture this little animated television, you know, jumping into a truck and driving up to your front door and jumping out and stealing into your house, breaking in, plunking itself in your living room and reaching out its little cartoon arm and grabbing your kids and forcing them to watch. You know. The notion that government, that if government were to force television, for example, to be less violent, people will be less violent, seems to rest on several other assumptions uh, some of which are kind of scary to me anyway, to believe this notion you have to believe that people were less violent before the invention of television. Tell that to a Norse berserker or Attila the Hun. I don't know. I don't buy it. And you also have to believe that the state can control people's behavior by controlling what's on television. Big Brother may not be watching, but he knows what he wants you to watch, and he wants to be able to tell you to watch only what he t thinks is good for you. Likewise, computer bulletin boards are said to prey upon or stalk children particularly. And there have been some disturbing incidents. But let's look at these more closely and think about them for a minute. A young man who had been accessing information via computer agreed to meet a stranger he had conversed with on a computer bulletin board dealing with the subject of homosexuality at the stranger's house. He physically got up from his computer screen, went out of his house, and went to a stranger's house to meet that person where he was sexually assaulted. And the media blamed the computer bulletin board, not the rapist. And not, I might add, the young man's own tragic naivete. The same is true of a rather inflammatory story that NBC's Dateline did about the availability of bomb building information on the internet. A couple of Canadian kids blew a few of their fingers off, trying out a recipe that they had found on the internet. And in Illinois, some kids went on a mailbox demolition spree, sort of an advanced firecracker in the mailbox prank, except this time, they were using rather sophisticated and powerful steel pipe bombs. They learned how to build them on information available on the internet. The police discovered in investigating this crime in one kid's so-called playroom above his garage a virtual bomb building factory stocked with steel pipes, chemicals, fuses, and explosives. And the response of the media, once again, a lot of hand wringing over the availability of the information. They never even bothered to ask, where were this kid's parents? 
how could he stock up his playroom above the garage with explosives and his parents be utterly oblivious to it? I mean, they didn't even indicate that they had asked the parents for a comment and the parents would prefer not to comment and decline, which under the circumstances would have been perfectly understandable. And I want to make it clear I'm not attacking parents because I don't know anything about them. But that's kind of the point. They just didn't mention the parents at all. I think it's lucky the kid got caught by the police before he blew them all to kingdom come. I can picture, you know, grieving relatives on the 10 o'clock news, weeping after the kid has blown somebody up or blown up the garage. Oh, you know, we never knew. We just never imagined. Well, I'm here to tell you that parents had better start imagining and paying some attention to what their kids are up to. Think for a minute. Just as any parent who is conscious wouldn't leave a loaded gun around the house where a kid could get it or let their kid pile up an arsenal of pipe bombs in the freaking garage, uh, you know, I, I, I can't understand really how this happened, and that's why I feel I haven't been told the whole story. You know, I mean, ding dong, UPS, your fuses, ma'am, thank you, and have a nice day. Where do you get the money to pay for it all? Where did all the chemicals come from? How did they all get up there in the playroom? But anyway, don't leave a loaded computer around your house and let your kids use it unsupervised. Parents have a responsibility to know what is out there and to guide their children. I mean, it's their house. If the kid is accessing or may access things that you don't want him to access, then pull the modem out of the computer or lock it up when you're out of the house. But don't leave little Johnny upstairs merrily downloading pornographic images and then claim that you're shocked, shocked to discover that this information is available. You should have known that before you bought him a computer. The same is true for library use. It's a parent's responsibility to not be oblivious to what is available Similarly, libraries are said to be foisting an agenda on innocence merely by making a diversity of information available for voluntary choice and reading. As if the books or the librarians, you know, are chasing people around and wrestling them to the floor and forcing them to read books that they don't want to read. The Chicago Tribune used to routinely print letters to the editor complaining about the latest Doonesbury strip. You know, expressing shock and outrage that the Tribune should be subjecting its readers to this. And I always wanted to write a letter back that said, I'm shocked, shocked to discover that the Tribune is delivering comic strip enforcers with each and every issue of its newspaper, standing over people and making them read comic strips they don't want to read. Look, as a practical matter, libraries attract readers to the materials intended for them and appropriate for them. Children's and youth librarians tell me that kids grow bored very quickly with materials which are too advanced for them. But the list of materials which some adults consider too advanced or too scary or just plain wrong grows ever longer every year. Fairy tales have taken some hits lately. Snow White was challenged because of violence, and a fairy tale called King Stork because of violence toward women. We even had a complaint about Hansel and Gretel, not as you might expect, the usual complaint from a conservative Christian organization worried about Satanism and the occult, but in this instance, from a self-proclaimed witch who didn't like the stereotypical portrayal of witches as child-eating monsters and felt that the fairy tale reinforced the message that it was okay to kill witches. Uh, and therefore, she wanted it pulled out of the Mount Diablo, and coincidentally, uh, school district <laughs> in California. We've had a challenge to a book called The Cabbages Are Chasing the Rabbits because it was al allegedly anti-hunting, and a challenge uh, to a book called Eli's Song because it had an anti-logging ecological slant. <laughs> Satanism and the occult are still on the list of concerns that we're hearing about these days. Several school districts and public libraries have canceled any celebration, recognition, or observation of the Halloween holiday, uh, canceling events or holiday displays because of complaints that these allegedly advance the so-called religion of witchcraft or Wicca. Library-sponsored programming and displays have been affected by this atmosphere. Books by Stephen King, Shel Silverstein and even C.S. Lewis have been challenged on the grounds that they promote Satanism. Apparently the complainant on the C.S. Lewis books was unaware of his Christian theological writings. The same things happened to another Christian theologian, Madeline Longle. Her A Wrinkle in Time has been accused of promoting Satanism and witchcraft because it has a supernatural element to it. A classic Nathaniel Hawthorne story, Young Goodman Brown, about the Salem witch trials was challenged in Copenhagen, New York because a group of 20 or so parents claimed that it sent the wrong message about witchcraft. Obviously, they believed there was only right, one right message, but I couldn't quite tell what it was from that challenge. Okay to burn, not okay to burn. Okay to burn, not okay to burn. I don't know. The most challenged author over the past few years was Alvin Schwartz, 
who write scary stories books for kids. I guess some people think they just live up to their titles too well. One of my favorite scary story type book challenges came uh, to a book by Jack Prilutsky called Nightmares, Poems to Trouble Your Sleep. Someone complained because it caused nightmares. <laughs> well, other titles challenged due to Satanism include uh, uh, a book called The Halloween ABCs, Roald Dahl's The Witches. Somebody complained about that one because the little boy was changed into a mouse and had to stay a mouse at the end. They thought that wasn't good for children. Christopher Pike and R.L. Stein have started to get the censor's attention, along with anything by Stephen King. And anything that so much as mentions witches, devils, demons, uh, or even mythology or magic. Uh, we had a challenge to another Greek myth, the myth of Cerberus, um, the dog who guards the gates of Hades, because the version of it being used in a school had illustrations which were allegedly pornographic. These were plates by Raphael and Michelangelo. <laughs> Any books which present factual information about sex and include even neutral mention of the subject of homosexuality, like it exists, have been challenged. Boys and sex, changing bodies, changing lives, families, a celebration of diversity, the new teenage body book, when someone you know has AIDS, etc. Other titles designed to discuss homosexuality, understandably for young people, including Daddy's Roommate, which was the most challenged title last year, or Annie on My Mind, which is the subject of, lawsuit, of a lawsuit going to trial in Kansas, <clears throat> and Heather Has Two Mommies, as well as new, new titles like Kefir Boy, which includes one scene of homosexuality in it. These have all felt the censor's muzzle or attempted muzzle. But in places where books like these have been challenged, poignant and courageous public statements have been made by people who stood up in public meetings and said, I wish I had had books like this when I was growing up. My life would have been better for it. And the point is that, surprise, there are children who live in so-called non-traditional families, and they need to see themselves depicted in literature. There are young people who studies show are at extremely heightened risk for suicide because of their confusion and fear about their emerging sexuality. And they need information. They need to know that they're not alone. Parents can choose whether or not their own children will read these books, but most of the complaints that we hear about come from people who don't realize that they contain within them an admission of the abdication of parental responsibility. I left my kid in the library, and just look what he found. Protect me from this. Judy Bloom still garners complaints. Uh, we took a few complaints last year about her book Forever, which in one instance in Wisconsin was literally ripped from the hands of a senior high school student who was reading it on her own time in the school cafeteria. Incidentally, in that uh, instance, a jury recently awarded a school counselor who spoke out against the censorship of the book and was um, either terminated or suspended because of it. A jury found that that was the reason that he was terminated or suspended and awarded him more than $300,000. So sometimes standing up for First Amendment rights pays off, I guess. We've seen a slight increase in challenges in this year and the past year coming from the so-called politically correct point of view, including older children's uh, books about Native Americans, Chinese Americans, African Americans, and Latin Americans. Laura Ingalls Wilder, Little House on the Prairie, was banned in Sturgis, South Dakota elementary schools because it was derogatory to Native Americans. And the Newbery Medal winner, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, was removed from ninth grade reading lists at the Arcadia, Louisiana High School for racial bias. Rather than suggest materials which can be added to a curriculum or a library collection, often the arbiters of correct thinking want the historical record of how people used to think obliterated from library collections. I guess they forgot that old adage about those who forget the past. The most consistent thing about censors is that they are never content to regulate only their own reading or that of their own children. They want to make sure that no one else is reading or thinking things with which they disagree. They'll say things like, oh, of course I'm not worried about my child, but what about all those other children with those bad parents out there, or with no parents at all? Well, the solution to the problem of poorly parented children is to find their parents or guardians and make them accountable. Censoring the library collection is a ludicrous response and one that ducks the real issue and avoids the real problem. Kids with absent or drug addicted or abusive or even just stressed out and exhausted parents are going to be in exactly the same boat whether or not you have Madonna's book or Daddy's roommate on your shelves. So let's make sure we're playing on the right field here. The library's mission is the provision of information and ideas. 
from all points of view on topics of current and historical interest for all of the people who use the library. Not the single-handed mending of social woes through a stupid non-solution like censorship. And when you think about it this way, it becomes pretty clear that the censors don't really care about what other people's kids are doing very much. They just don't want their own sensibilities bruised. It amazes me how hot under the collar people can get demanding rights that they already have. Parents will say, oh, give us the right to guide our children. Well, you already have that right. What they're not entitled to, but what they clearly want, is to make the library do their parenting for them. Here's a list of the things I don't want my child to read. You take care of it. I've got better things to do. Well, look, nobody ever said parenting was going to be easy or convenient. And let me just say that as a new parent uh, who has experienced a predictable but nonetheless shocking to me burst of conservatism upon uh, <laughs> gazing into the innocent face of my beautiful daughter, I can sympathize with parental concerns. But libraries exist to provide information to whoever needs or wants it. Parents exist to raise their kids. Libraries can be tremendously helpful by doing what they do, providing information that can help, but they will not usurp the parental role. A parent who wants a library to enforce access restrictions is a parent who doesn't want to pay uh, the time or invest time in paying attention to what their child is reading. Not just making sure that their child is not reading what they don't want them to read, but also paying attention to what the child is reading. Talking with the child about it and being involved. Coming to the library with the child, choosing books together. Where does it stop? Well, it doesn't. If you look at the table of contents of a recent issue of the newsletter on intellectual freedom, here are just a few of the books listed as recently challenged. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The Bluest Eye, Bridge to Terabithia, The Castle in the Attic, Cat's Paw, The K. So far, we've had two Newbery winners in that list. The Chocolate War, The Color Purple, A Day No Pigs Would Die, Forever, Go Ask Alice. Ooh, last from the past. <laughs> in Country, Killing Mr. Griffin, The Last Mission. Harry Mazur's books, incidentally, um, many librarians tell me are among the few that are of particular interest to young boys of a particular age, and, and he seems to get challenged a lot. More Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, Alan Schwartz once again. Naomi in the Middle, The New Joy of Gay Sex, Of Mice and Men, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denozovich. Run, Shelley, Run, The Short Prose Reader, Tex, When Legends Die, Seventeen Magazines, and the film The Miracle of Life and Schindler's List. But one basic and important point that I wish to make is that in expressing their opinions and their concerns, would-be censors are exercising the same rights that we seek to protect when we confront censorship. If we fail to preserve these rights of free expression, everyone loses. Thomas Paine said, he that would make his own liberty secure must protect, must guard even his enemy from opposition, for if he fails in this duty, he establishes a precedent that will reach to himself. Unfortunately, I think what Winston Churchill said about free speech is uh, more uh, accurate in terms of how most people think of it. Everyone is in favor of free speech. Hardly a day passes without its being extolled, but some people's idea of it is that they are free to say whatever they like. But if anyone says anything back, hmm, that is an outrage. <laughs> so I remind librarians every day to guard against behavior that might itself be interpreted as censorious, even if their patience is being sorely tested. Would-be censors are quick to pounce on any statement or action that seems to suggest that they are not entitled to participate in the democratic process as much as anyone else. They are. Their rights to try to convince others of their points of view, their rights to engage in religious activity and religious speech, and their right to have access to the information that they think is good and healthy is protected by that same First Amendment. I never can understand what makes them think that if they force or pressure the government to violate the First Amendment rights of their fellow citizens and to restrict information, access to information that they don't like, why they think the government won't one day use that very power to restrict access to information that they do like. In fact, the pressure groups routinely assert that their First Amendment rights have been violated by libraries through a, an allegedly deliberate exclusion of religious or conservative materials. It's just that they almost always couple this observation with the demand to ban books. They're free to try to persuade you not to read something, but when they succeed in getting a government agency to remove books, they've gone too far, and they've violated the First Amendment. Deciding what materials are appropriate for kids, that's a parent's job. You all know that kids mature at different rates. Their reading levels, their interests, their backgrounds are very diverse, and libraries must serve the needs of all users, not just the biggest loudmouths complaining about what other people's kids shouldn't be reading. 
Some parents recognize that as a natural part of the process of maturing, children and teenagers will challenge their parents' beliefs. And they value the library as an unrestricted access and resource, access to information and resource for their kids. You know, better they should explore new ideas through materials available at the library than out on the street. Libraries must respect the rights of parents who want their children to have opportunities to explore ideas without restrictions. Implementing age-based restrictions on the collection takes away that right. Parents who want more restriction on their children must recognize that in a free society that wants to stay free and values individual liberty, it's their responsibility to find ways to impose restrictions on their kids without curtailing others' freedom, and that is really the choice. Freedom and democracy are a step along a road to a police state full of pressure to conform and battles over who gets to inform, uh, enforce what standard on whom. We decided a long time ago in this country that individual liberty in matters of opinion and conscience is best. So if you're a person who's concerned about censorship, what do you do? Well, for one thing, get visible. You're very lucky in Iowa City because um, you live in a community that values intellectual freedom and the free exchange of ideas. You need to show yourselves constantly to be the caring and decent people that you are. I think it's more important than ever that the general public sees itself as a group, as people who like to read, like to view art and listen to music, watch movies and films, and who are intellectually capable of handling all of the above and who are not particularly interested in sticking their nose into everybody else's choices in that regard. Support your local libraries in their efforts to make available a broad diversity of information which will serve all of the people who use the library, not just the most vocal, the best connected, the politically most powerful, or even the majority, but all of the people of the community. And support their efforts to make information technology available and accessible to all. It's also important that people generally, and particularly politicians these days, see that people of faith are not homogenous that there are serious and profound disagreements in theology and philosophy among people who consider themselves adherents to a religious faith. Many such people consider it their moral obligation to ensure the availability of ideas and information about this world so that the process of living an examined life which leads to spiritual growth can occur. Many such people consider tolerance of differences a very high moral value. So let's quit being so scared of religion and start talking seriously about it rather than just flinging around tautologies which are designed only to exclude those who don't, do not believe as we do from the discussion. Talk about the Bill of Rights. There's a common, very common, rather shockingly common misunderstanding on the part of many people about individual liberty in a democracy. Many people believe that since we live in a democracy, the majority should always rule including deciding what materials should be available to people to read or view in public library collections. They'll say, well, shouldn't the taxpayers decide? Shouldn't a majority of the taxpayers get to say what books should be on the shelves in a public library? This is not the case. The Bill of Rights was expressly developed and adopted to protect individual rights and the rights of minorities, the rights of unpopular people with unpopular ideas and of individuals who were different than the majority. The Bill of Rights carves out certain fundamental individual liberties uh, for the specific purpose of keeping those rights inviolate from majority rule. These are rights that cannot be voted away. The Founding Fathers recognized the potential for what they called the tyranny of the majority and drafted the Bill of Rights to protect against it. This aspect of our free society directly impacts public and publicly supported library service. Help your friends and your community understand that when it comes to First Amendment rights of freedom of speech and of the press, the majority does not rule. The First Amendment protects the lone voice crying in the wilderness just as strongly as it protects the shouting of the multitude. Libraries, therefore, make available in their collections materials which present viewpoints that are offensive to some and even to many people. Remember, even those who are offended may have a need to know or inform themselves about these viewpoints. Show yourselves as people who value liberty, even above safety, which is a rather radical idea in these crime, drug, and disease-obsessed times. It was a radical idea at the time of the American Revolution, too, but it won the day. Benjamin Franklin said, they that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. As the millennium approaches and people, you know, sort of come out of the woodwork about the end of the world, etc., 
And we feel more and more beleaguered by a lousy economy or crime or inhumanity or disrespect or intolerance. Let's each resolve to be a little flame of decency, of tolerance, of liberty, shining in what we're always being told is this darkness. The Constitution does not guarantee a safe or a complacent life. Quoting Hobbes about the nature of life, that it is solitary, nasty, brutish, and short, <laughs> my favorite character, Adam, from my favorite now lamentably, but I guess mercifully defunct television show, Northern Exposure, pointed out that the Declaration of Independence declares our inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit. It does not guarantee that you will never be disturbed by the expression of ideas different than yours. It does not promise that you will never have your feelings hurt. We do live in an often dangerous, nasty, disease-ridden, violence-prone world, but surely suppressing information about the state of our planet can't change it or make it better. I started out with Little Red Riding Hood. I want to finish with the three little pigs. If you remember the story, the smart little pig built this house of brick, and no amount of big bad wolf huffing and puffing could blow that house down. And so the wolf tried to come down the chimney, and when he did, he fell right into a waiting vat of boiling water. And the three little pigs had wolf soup and lived happily ever after. My guess is that smart little pig had a great librarian. <laughs> Thank you very much.